conducted by SFU School of Communication, found almost no Aboriginal representation in a sample of over 70 hours of prime time drama last year. Since the demise of the CBC's North of 60 TV series, our Aboriginal communities as fictional places have entirely disappeared from our screens. Not only have we let the budgets of the CBC dwindle, but our public broadcaster is not the place for public storytelling it could be. The CBC today has little role in initiating films in Canada. You will discover tonight that the CBC placed no money in Fast Runner and made only a loose commitment to air it. We are still waiting for the CBC to exhibit Fast Runner. The debate is over its length and something Mr. Kunert is at great pains not to sacrifice. To quote the Fast Runner's co-producer, Nathan Cohen, realistically, when people ask us what was challenging about our film, we don't talk about the weather, we talk about the politics. What it was like to convince the Canadian system and the world system that a bunch of Inuit video makers at the end of the world could make a world-class movie if they had the chance. There are a number of unique paradoxes about The Fast Runner. The film did not gain widespread public attention in Canada until after it won at Cannes. And still today, there are more movie reviews from international sources than there are at home. It has still not received widespread theatrical release here. Yet according to Mr. Richard Sturzberg, the new president of Telefilm Canada, the public agency responsible for investing in film, at an art at the fast runner is one of just three Canadian movies to pass one million at the box office in the past three years. The other two, for those of you of interest, are Men with Brooms by Robert Lantos and Hollywood Bollywood, a remarkable commentary on the changing cinema in Canada. We obviously have a great deal to learn in English Canada about growing a distinct cinematic or televisual culture. Is this because we all too often think like cultural accountants rather than artists? This would not be the outcome early pioneers of public broadcasting like Graham Spry or Alan Plonk would want. And it is important for citizens and community groups to change the very way we talk about the importance of public, non-commercial culture. Zacharias's mission like that of Aboriginal artists, is a big one. To quote Ruby Truly, a director and independent video producer from the Kootenays, who I believe is present here tonight, um, who attended the masterclass, as artists, we are myth makers of who we are as a people. We hold these myths in our family stories, passed down through time from mother's tongue to son and in our fiction. We hold them in poems and in our music, we hold them in our paintings and in our pottery, in our tapestries and in our sculpture. We hold them in our dance and in our drama, in our photography and in our video. We hold these myths in the work that is inspired by tradition, as well as that which is fueled with an urgency to experiment and explore. It is work that comments and work that questions. It is work that explodes with triumph, springs with grief, staggers with wonder, and crumbles with humility. We are the myth makers of who we are as a people, and we constantly place and replace that myth into the world. And what we create becomes a part of a vast and diverse vocabulary, instantly familiar in a visceral way, like in our bones, and through which we communicate our myth in a large and public arena at the very same instant with a very intimate, personal, and private connection to the heart. I thank you for that quote. And I thank you for attending tonight. We have asked Mr. Kuhner to share with us his dream of growing the art of storytelling for his Inuit people. And it is my very great pleasure to present Mr. Zacharias Kuhner. house on the land. Uh, my mother would be telling these 
stories like that and now they're to, to Buddhists. My brothers and sisters sleeping side by side to sleep. Um, I used to um, use my camex as my pillow and I would uh, wake up and they would be frozen and I would put them on and they thought. <laughs> and I was learning um, and my father was a hunter and he had dogs and he would be hit, uh, harnessing his dogs and I had one dog that he couldn't catch uh, so he would, uh, my mother would wake me up and go get your dog and I would go and the dog is friendly only to me and my father, I would give it to my father. So I was dreaming uh, that I would be a hunter one day but uh, at the age of nine uh, my parents uh, finally got the message, uh, why aren't there kids in school? Um, kids in Canada at the age of five, they're in school. And, and here I was, nine years old. So that was my worst day. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's no TV in the Greek in 19, I came to Greek in 1966. There was no TV in the Greek. Uh, we kept voting TV out uh, twice because there was no uh, CBC had no TV program. Um, we used to go to uh, uh, our community hall, which had uh, 60 millimeter uh, movies. And at the age of 12, I started uh, doing sculpture. Uh, so I would try to finish it before the short time and filing away and try to sell it to my teachers uh, and because I was quite to get it and I, I would uh, sometimes be late but uh, most of the time I made it. And watching cowboys and Indians and John Wayne in the cavalry and I was watching this movie uh, one evening and John Wayne was my man and <laughs> He would to we were in the fort and he sent out scouts and like I was one of the soldiers. And they didn't come back so we went out and they were dead. Uh, our soldiers and uh, horses had arrows everywhere. And, and what kind of Indians did this? And because I was thinking like those soldiers as I got older and saw myself as an Aboriginal person, I learned that there's two sides to every story. And as I got uh, older, I doing good in uh, Substrum, uh, covering for more money. Now I could own uh, 35 millimeter cameras, uh, experimenting um, with different uh, types of uh, cameras. So um, one day in 1980, I heard that you could own uh, any breathing person, could own a moving picture camera. And that was the day I decided to, I, I gotta have one. And my carving buddy, who also played Atanamba, Natal and uh, we did uh, two week uh, carving and we flew down. And I traded my uh, car for a uh, Peter Mac camera, for a quarter pack, you know, VCR, and I bought myself a 26 inch TV. And because um, I wanted to record uh, my, I would watch my father, he would go hunting, come home with his hunting buddies and drink tea and tell these terrific stories. And, I wanted to capture it. Um, so I started, I tried filming, and even though my camera said color was black and white for two months, because it was just a little button that <laughs> <laughs> with the color balance that uh, I missed. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, every night I would try to play my tape through my TV. And I, I noticed kids playing outside would be stuck to my window watching my TV. And some nights I would just uh, 
start to realize there's a lot of kids in my house watching TV. <laughs> yeah, the power of TV. Um, since I was already trying to do it on my own, and Inuit Broadcasting Corporation was starting in 1982, uh, Paul Rappach, um, our late screenwriter, was the only person working. He hired me, and I learned a lot from him. Um, our center uh, was run um, in the Ottawa office. They, IBC had an Ottawa office. They uh, run everything, I, and the finance department is in Ottawa, and on. And in eight years with the corporation, I became um, a station manager. Uh, but uh, in my eight years, in 1985, uh, there was uh, a camera seminar happening in a nearby community, Iqalit, and I never had any uh, formal training. So I flew down, uh, the corporation flew me down, and I met uh, this guy who was training camera, Norman Cohn. And that's when I met my partner, and I flew back with him and became with him when, since uh, we've been married for 17 years. <laughs> and in the corporation, uh, there was no room for drama because they never had any uh, money to do that. And Norman Cohn introduced the Canada Council to us, then we applied, and we got our first Canada Council grant in 1985. Um, we made a, a short uh, video uh, from any point of view, um, which to today we still haven't subtitled. I had to do these uh, on, on holiday in um, uh, leave without pay. Um, I started doing my own uh, projects with my team. My team uh, was uh, Norman Cohn, Paul Apak, and Paul Holitzik. We also made uh, Khargip in 1988, and in 1999 we uh, decided that uh, New Broadcasting Corporation is not the place for our goals, and we broke off, and we made a First independent uh, Inuit video production company, Isuma, uh, we call it because when you're doing all these things, you have to do a lot of thinking, and Isuma means uh, to think. Uh, these same uh, four partners are as shareholders. Um, we started making, uh, we started to recreate the past. Because since uh, when we used to work for a broadcasting corporation, we would visit elders and they would tell us terrific stories. And when you get down to the editing table, you have no footage. So um, to make it was our goal. And uh, when we got to doing a good series, and then the next ambitious project to do was to do a feature length and Paul Apak uh, um, decided that we would do at an object um, because we all grew up with this story and once it was told to you, you never forgot that naked man running around the ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all heard this story. And now it was the first time with uh, new technology that uh, since TV came, everybody started stop visiting one another. Uh, it was time to put these stories through TV. Yeah, we did. Um, we started to write at an object in 1995. Uh, we did not shoot until 1999 because it was very hard to get funding. Uh, CBC and Telefilm did not believe in us. The writing team turned the story into a professional script. Apec, me, Norman, Collected, and Panel were writing every day for two months. Um, we also had a consult, we also consulted with a script writer, uh, Anne Frank, uh, from Toronto. 
Then we submitted uh, to Telefilm in 1998, but refused us. Uh, the Aboriginal language fund was too small. <coughs> no space for Inuit in the national system. It took us all year arguing for that space in the national system. Fin finally, we got approved by the National Film Board and Telefilm Canada, and we started to shoot in 1999 and editing was in 2000. Um, our first premiere was in Italy, December 2000. Six months shooting from April to September. We went to the actual location where the story happened. And, and our, we did it in the Inuit style production. Of course, actors had to learn their characters. Uh, following a script in all kind of weather, and the sun is always changing. Um, food, uh, we hired hunters to hunt for us so um, we could eat because we had no catering trucks in the audience. We did start with teamwork, uh, the usual way of film. Films are made. Um, every time I mean, we work a whole song, uh, and the film star would be a military star. Uh, we would be talking, what, how are we going to shoot this? Uh, with my uh, art directors down to my sound man. Um, we put the whole community to work uh, costumes, props. Uh, we had a $2 million budget and $1 million paid to the people of the Buick. People learned to practice their own culture, language. And of course, we had no start from English. <laughs> Everything was authentic, handmade. Uh, we are storytellers. And for 4,000 years in passing the stories to our youth, 